Good evening, my name is Debbie Coleman. I am a podiatrist by training, but I'm currently the diabetic foot coordinator at Homerton Hospital in East London. Hello, my name is Fran Campbell. I'm the lead for podiatry and biomechanics at Accelerate, and I have a special interest in gait movement and managing lymphedema, uh, lipedema, and leg ulcer patients. And it's a real honor for both of us to be here closing a fabulous Legs Matter Week this week and to be in the company of all those clinicians out there that are so passionate about promoting leg health. And also a big thank you to all those patients that have kindly shared their stories this week. Um, legs matter for life and not just for Legs Matter Week. Let's remember that. Hello, we both welcome you this evening um, to this discussion on being in the know and about the importance of leg and foot health with a focus on mobility, knowing about your condition and about seeking out reputable advice. So Debbie and I have known each other for about 15 years, do you think? Yeah, roughly that. Mm. And we used to work together. And this conversation is just like some of the chats that we used to have when we were working together back in the day, isn't it, Debbie? <laughs> it is. Yeah. So let's start at the foot and then move up the leg. So um, Debbie, tell me about how diabetes can affect your feet. Yeah, thanks, Fran. So diabetes can affect your feet in two main ways. The first is um, the loss of feeling in the feet, so something called peripheral neuropathy. And in very simple terms, if you're diabetic, uh, that results in you having too much sugar in your blood. And as that sugar travels around your body, it attaches itself to various structures and the nerves, particularly in your feet, are one of those structures and it stops those nerves from working properly. So initially it can lead to those nerves becoming hypersensitive. So it's not uncommon for people with diabetes to report that they get um, burning sensations, particularly at night time. But then over time, that nerve can stop working altogether and that can result in numbness. So patients would then describe things such as um, their feet feeling heavy, like they're wrapped in cotton wool, like they're walking on pebbles, for example. And the problem with losing the feeling in your feet is that uh, feeling and pain is a protective mechanism. Um, so it's a, we can use the analogy of driving a car. You have someone who's not diabetic driving their car. Um, there is an electrical fault in the engine and the warning light comes on tell them there's a problem they'll stop driving take their car to the garage and get the electrical fault fixed and not no damage is done to the car in someone who's di who has diabetes their car doesn't have that warning signal so when they they have the electrical fault they don't stop driving they keep driving the electrical fault causes a fire and causes huge damage in the in the car's engine um, and so that's what happens in diabetes is that if you haven't got that warning sign, if you don't have pain, you can damage the foot, not realize it, keep walking and cause further damage. Mm. So losing the feeling in, in the feet sounds quite risky. Um, how would you check to check a patient's feet for the loss of feeling and to see if it's getting worse over time? Yeah, absolutely. So knowing that you don't have feeling is the important thing. Um, and so every diabetic should have a, a, what we call an annual foot check. And that's usually part of their diabetes annual review. So that can happen at your GP practice. It might be your practice nurse. It, or if you're already under a podiatry service, it might be the podiatrist. Um, and that check will, um, will be made up of a couple of bits. The first thing is looking at how much feeling you have in your feet. And they would use something called a, a monofilament. This is a piece of equipment which is a nylon thread, and they touch your feet at various points and see whether you can feel it. Um, the second point part of the uh, annual check is checking your circulation, and that's the other thing that diabetes can affect. Um, so this can affect how much blood gets down to your feet. So diabetes causes the, the blood vessels, the, the vessels that carry the blood from your heart to your feet to become much narrower and reduces the amount of blood that gets down to your foot. Uh, and what that means is that the, over time, the skin can become far more fragile, far more prone to breaking open because it's the blood that takes all the food and nutrients to the skin to keep it healthy. And if the skin is more fragile, then it's more susceptible to breaking open. And so patients are more likely to develop problems like ulcers and wounds on their feet. Right. 
And what about swelling in the foot? How would you deal with that? Yeah, so swelling isn't specifically associated with diabetes, but certainly we get lots of patients with diabetes that have swelling as well. And the main problem with having a swollen foot is the difficulty that you might face finding a shoe to accommodate that swelling. Um, and so it's um, often patients that have swelling will talk about the swelling changing during the day. So it may be that they wake up in the morning, the foot isn't particularly swollen at all. But then during the day, that gets much worse. Um, so you need to have a shoe that will accommodate those, those fluctuations in size. So something like a shoe with a lace or a Velcro strap, something that you can make bigger and smaller is going to help to accommodate the swelling and reduce the risk that you're going to develop any problems because the shoe is rubbing, for example. Mm. And in terms of footwear, what are the options? So are we talking things like retail footwear or, you know, footwear that you could, say, make for a patient or modifications to footwear? Yeah. Yeah, there's lots of different options. And in, in most circumstances, uh, patients will be able to find shoes on the high street that will accommodate it. It might be that you have to go for a slightly bigger size, but going for a shoe that's got um, a few a few things. So usually a trainer style shoe is quite good. Something with, like I say, with a lace, something that's um, a foot shape. So a nice rounded toe, plenty of depth in it. So it's going to accommodate your toes and any swelling. Um, and then there'll be a small percentage of patients that, that, that can't find shoes on the high street. Um, and there are various services that will either help direct you to specialist shoes suppliers, or they mm -hmm. may have to make you shoes instead. Um, the, the only thing I'd add on there really is about rocker sold shoes. And um, those shoes can help with mobility, but they can also help, you know, to offload areas in the in the foot where there are ulcerations and um, you know we also recommend rock sold shoes to um, patients that have lymphedema and leg ulcer patients because it can help to enhance something called the calf muscle pump which is really important in helping to um, you know keep that 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 the muscle in the back of the leg patent so that it can push the fluid out of the leg. Can you can you describe what a rock or soul shoe is? And as a patient, where might I find uh, a rock or soul shoe? Mm. So a rock or soul shoe is if you look at the bottom of the shoe, if it's not flat and it's got a little bit of a toe spring, so it sits up slightly at the front, it might slid up sit up slightly at the back as well. That's what we call a rock or soul shoe, and you can get those shoes from the high street but they can be sometimes soft. And what sometimes people need is something with a harder rocker, a harder sold rocker. Yeah. And in that case, you know, you can get footwear modified um, to have a, a rocker applied. With rockers, it's quite, um, it, it's quite, you need to have the proper assessment to know which type of rocker is the best um, for your particular um, mobility because some patients where you put very stiff rockers on the shoes don't always kind of tolerate them very well so it's really important that you know you get an assessment done by a podiatrist and that they look at your footwear look at the, the issues that you've got and then they can give you advice on what would be the right type of rocker sold shoe to to go out and get or they might refer you on to get one made yeah yeah I mean certainly rocker sole shoes are something that we often recommend like you rightly said um but one of the things that we find sometimes is that it can affect a patient's balance um and that's another thing about diabetes when it comes to mobility along with that loss of feeling so you can't feel pain you can also lose something called your, your proprioception and um, proprioception is your ability to know where your limbs are in relation to your body um, and it's a thing that means that even if you have your eyes closed, you know where your arms are if they're above your head or to the side, for example. Um, and so losing that can make you feel a lot more unsteady. Um, so that's another important consideration with footwear to make sure that the shoe is going to mean that you feel more stable and you're less likely to fall. Mm. Yes, I mean, falls and balance is definitely an issue in the diabetic and lymphedema and wound population. So important to make sure that we we screen for that and, and manage that yeah and we want to maintain people's mobility um, and certainly with diabetes you know you want some of those are some lifestyle changes that will be recommended 
you know, along with a healthy diet, it'll be around you know, exercising. And that might be just something, something as simple as gentle exercise, walking regularly. Um, and But the key thing would be ensuring that any shoe, anytime you do an exercise, you want to make sure the shoe you're wearing is appropriate for that particular thing that you're doing. So if you decide to go out for a walk, fantastic. We would definitely recommend that. But you need to make sure that the shoe you're wearing when you go for the walk is going to protect your feet. So that's why we, we go back to trainers a lot because trainers tend to have all the the um, the elements that we'd like to see in a good shoe that's going to protect your foot and reduce the risk that you'll develop any any open sores or problems related to your diabetes. Uh, so, um, I mean, you know that we used to work together and we used to work in the foot health department and now I'm working at Accelerate. So, um, you know, the patients that I see do have um, a lot of mobility issues. And it's been quite an eye opener in terms of um, what types of mobility issues patients have had, have got, sorry. So um, my input within the team is really important in helping with mobility because mobility is so important. And mobility doesn't just mean exercise, it can be, mean movement, it can mean walking, um, you know, especially moving the ankles. That's really, really important because as I mentioned before about the calf muscle pump, the ankle is something that operates the calf muscle pump. And if you lose your, your motion in your ankle, then that can, you know, inhibit that calf muscle pump. And then that can inhibit the fluid that's moving from your feet up into your legs. Again, you know, when we talk about exercise and movement, if you have issues with, you know, standing for long periods, or if you have issues with walking, you can do some forms of movement with your ankles, with your legs, you know, just sitting down in a chair and you can use TheraBands. These things can really, really help to reduce the swelling in your legs. So even if you are having issues with, you know, walking, or if you're having issues with standing for long periods of time or you don't have great balance, then you can still do some exercises in the chair. Uh, again, which the podiatrist could, could go through with you um, at any time. Can you explain a little bit more about what you mean about mobility and movement? and why is that important for leg health, particularly in these clients that have leg ulcers mm. and lymphedema? So again, mobility can range from doing exercise if you're able, but it just really means keeping moving during the day. So trying not to sit, you know, for long periods of time, trying again, if you're, if you're standing for long periods of time, making sure that you're moving around. Walking something that we obviously try and promote um, but again, if it's very, very difficult, then, um, you know, you can, like I've, I've mentioned, do some exercises sitting down. The main thing that we need to do is to try and keep that calf muscle pump moving. And what that is, is it's to do with the muscles in the back of your legs that helps to squeeze the veins. And then that helps to move fluid from your legs into your, to your body. So it's actually considered the second heart. Did you know that, Debbie, that you've got no. a second heart in your legs? I didn't. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's, it's just so important to keep that um, patent, to keep your ankle moving and to keep that fluid moving throughout the day. Um, as I said, walking is great. Um, but, you know, if that's an issue, then you could do some seated exercises. You could do some calf raises. Um, there's a lot of things that you can do throughout the day that don't necessarily mean, you know, involve a huge amount of walking. So are there any other activities besides the walking that you can do to help with mobility? Mm. So you could certainly, if you enjoy swimming, that's something that you could do. Um, so that's something that's an option. If you've got a, you know, a dog, you might want to think about taking that dog for a little bit of a longer walk, perhaps one day. Um, thinking about, you know, myself, I used to play a lot of netball, but because of injuries and because I'm getting on a little bit, um, I'm actually doing walking netball now. So there might be an option for you out there if you've done a sport when you were, you know, back in the day or when you were younger or you can't do that sport anymore. There might be options for a kind of um, a lower intensity version of that sport. So it's worth looking at things like that. Um, I mean, things like dancing for example that's something that that you would might enjoy that you could could do to help improve your mobility um 
And that's something that you, you know, again, it's think about things that you enjoy and then incorporating exercise into your lifestyle with that. It's going to be a lot easier than um, and, and more beneficial for you as well because you'll be enjoying it, um, you know, to help improve your mobility throughout the day, the week. I think that's the key thing, isn't it? Find something you enjoy, something that you can fit into your routine so you can do it on a regular basis. Yeah, yeah. I know certainly as a, as a team where I work, we've been looking at, um, there are like walking groups um, available in, in the borough that I work in. And so you can go and it's a social activity as well. You're not doing it on your own. They will target it at different levels of fitness. So, you know, if you feel like you want to start slowly, there'll be other people there that will be able to, will at the same level of fitness as you. As you. Yeah, I've heard patients with lymphedema and swelling say that um, actually what they should be doing is sitting with their feet elevated, using the compression garments that they've been provided with and, and not doing exercise. Is, is that is that right? Well, there's I've heard that as well. And, and certainly people that I work with, uh, some lymphedema patients will say it's it's it can cause, you know, more issues doing exercise. And it, again, it's really up to um, having someone assess what your ability is in terms of the types of exercise that you should be doing. So exercise is not going to cause harm, um, especially if you've got lymphedema, it's better actually to do some form of exercise or movement throughout the day. So if you don't, then it can actually, you know, increase the swelling in your legs. Um, also patients that have leg ulcers, you know, again, it's really, really important that they think about moving around during the day because again that can help to um, reduce the amount of fluid that's in the leg yeah. um, and what we know also from from research is that you know moving that that calf muscle pump moving those legs can help you know as as will be part of the healing process for for ulcers so it's really really important that even if you've got lymphedema even if you've got leg ulcers talk to someone about what your level of exercise what your level of activity could be and then they will give you, you know, the advice. So any kind of healthcare professional, like a podiatrist, a physiotherapist, an OT, anything like that can assess what you're capable of doing, talk to you about what you should be doing, and then, you know, kind of devise a plan for you in terms of what you could do at your level. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? I think that's what it's, it's highlighting that it's important that you go to somebody who's going to give you reputable advice, you know, and that, that means somebody like uh, um, a qualified health professional, like you said, the physios, etc. Yes, uh, it's, it's extremely important that you get advice. Don't just take on um, an exercise program without getting some form of advice because, yeah. you know, you, you, you need to know what you're capable of you need to get some advice from, from a, a health professional that can assess you first and then can talk to you about um, the types of exercise that will be appropriate for you. Um, I mean, it's very easy to think, oh, you know, I'd like to do this. But if, if you know, you just have to be very, very careful about, about what you're doing. Like I say, there are healthcare professionals out there that you're probably seeing that um, would be able to give you the right advice. Or if they can't give you the right advice and they can refer you on, to a person that could do an assessment and then also um, talk to you about what would be appropriate for your level of, of, of act, for your level of um, activity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think there's lots of information out there, but it's not always the right information. So you need to be careful where your sources, it's got your, where your source of information is coming from. Um, I know that I have patients come to me um, with things that they've heard around, for example, um, soaking their feet in Dettol or other antiseptics um, which they have read is, a, is good for them. Um, but the, you know, it, we, it's not something we would recommend because it's very harsh, stringent using an antiseptic like that and actually can strip the skin of some of the natural good bacteria that's protecting the skin and creating a skin barrier to stop you from developing infections. So um, it is important to make sure that where you get your information from is a, is a reputable site. Right. When I was a podiatrist, I, I used to hear a lot, you know, I'm only a little bit diabetic. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, what do you what do you think about that? Yeah, that's something I hear lots. And that's because initially when you are diagnosed with diabetes, you may just be provided with information about how you can modify your lifestyle. And um, so it may be around changing your diet, increasing your exercise, etc. Um, but it is 
and um, that's what cl people classify as a little bit diabetic because they're not taking any medication um, but the problem with that is if it's not well controlled if you're not able to make those lifestyle changes those complications that we talked about the effects on your nerves the effects on your blood your circulation are still happening even in those early stages um, so it's quite a uh, makes people feel quite comfortable to think they're only say only a little bit diabetic but it's important that they understand the potential consequences if um, you're not able to adopt some of those changes that I recommended yeah it's, it's so important to get the right advice isn't it yeah absolutely it really does help to um you know it gives people the the kind of confidence to be able to to manage their conditions yeah and um also to make the right choices about what you're doing in terms of of your condition and, and helping you to manage it so yeah a reputable advice is is just so important is and there any particular um, sites that you recommend to patients with lymphedema or leg ulcers mm, i mean some of the websites that you know we'd recommend is you know obviously legs matters there's a wealth of advice mm -hmm. on here from a lot of very highly qualified, um, you know, practitioners. Um, also places like many of the NHS websites, uh, again, reputable websites that you could go to and get information from. Um, there's a lymph lymphedema support network and on their website, they've got a tick mark and it's called PIFTIC. And um, that is one way of knowing if a, um, a website's um, content is reputable or not. Now, mm. not, not every website will have that. It's just um, the websites that have joined up to have their content kind of um, checked by, by that particular um, organization. But yeah, that's, that's one way of checking that, that the um, advice is reputable. Another thing is that if you go to websites like, for example, um, the Lymphedema Support Network, and you, you like social media, then it's probably a good idea to go to those reputable websites. And if you wanted to join a Facebook group or if you wanted to join, um, you know, a Twitter, then you could probably the best place to link through it would be through those websites. Yeah. Um, because sometimes you can go onto Facebook, sometimes you can go onto Twitter and, you know, it might say lymphedema.org, but it might not actually be, you know, from that particular organization so um i would say if you do enjoy social media and you like to look at social media then it's probably a good idea to go to those reputable websites and then join you know the links in social media through through their particular web pages i think the ability to be able to link up with other people that have um the same condition as you is is really valuable and i think that can create a real support network um around you and at Diabetes UK is excellent and they have lots of videos um, many of them are uh, by patients that have a living with diabetes about their own experiences, not just around the foot, but, you know, all aspects of diabetes. And that's and that can be, I think, really helpful. Patients find that really, really helpful. I agree. Uh, it's, it's always, you know, excellent to try and branch, not branch out, but to reach out to other people that are in the same you know, position as you. Um, and it always does help to to talk about certain things yeah. um, that that might be affecting you. You might think that you're the only one that, that feels that way, but there are probably people out there that are dealing with the same issues that you are. And it's good to to talk about those things. Absolutely. People that 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 know what you're going through. So, um, Debbie, in terms of, have you got any kind of closing pearls um, of advice out there? Um, that you would recommend to to people um, about knowing about your condition and seeking the right advice? Yeah, I think the main thing is attending those foot checks so you know um, the health status of your foot at that particular point, and that's going to help you look after your feet. Uh, make sure that information that you get is from reputable sites, so things like Diabetes UK, this, um, the Royal College of Podiatry has some excellent information on there as well about how best you can look after your feet. Keep moving, we're always going to uh, uh, recommend that, but if you are going to move, then make sure that the footwear you're using is going to help protect your feet when you're doing that. How about you, Fran? Yeah, so, um, yeah, I would just say make small changes. That's, that's the thing. Don't make big changes, make small changes. Small changes mount up. So making small changes like walking a little bit further each day if you can or starting to do some seated exercises 
or perhaps looking into something that you could do that's going to um, ensure that you're moving around a little bit more during the day. Changing your footwear, that can have such a huge you know, um, effect. I've seen patients that have gone from a very flat plim sole and then I've recommended, say, a rocker sole shoe that they could get from the high street. And then I see them back again and the comfort in their feet is just, you know, improved tenfold. So even just by changing your footwear to something that's recommended for you can make a huge difference in the amount that you can do and also, you know, how comfortable things are for you in walking. Um, also with footwear, you know, just going back to what Debbie said earlier, you know, always choose the right shoe for the right activity. You know, if you're climbing Mount Everest, you do not do it in a pair of flip-flops, okay? So, you know, make sure that if you're if you're going to be walking a lot, you know, you might want to get a walking shoe or um, even a trainer. That's another thing that you can, can use, obviously, for walking. Um, if you're going to be doing any other forms of activities, just think about the, the footwear that you've got and making sure that it's the most appropriate you know, shoe for that particular activity. As I say, just, just changing your shoes can, can just pay huge dividends. Um, and getting the right size shoe is really, really important as well. And always ask for advice. Like we're here to give you advice to help you along with your condition. What we want to do is to help you. So always, whenever you, you see a clinician, a podiatrist, a physio, a nurse, you know, just, just don't be afraid to ask for, for advice because we're here to give you the, the, you know, good advice that can help to improve your health, to help improve your mobility. That's in our best interest, uh, you know, for you. So always ask for advice and try, as Debbie said, to always go and get reputable information. I know it's easy to go online. It's easy to go on a WhatsApp group and listen to things, but try and get, you know, the most reputable information that you can, because that's going to help you make the right choices for your health and prevent, you know, issues becoming worse in the future. Absolutely. Hello, hi. So um, I hope you enjoyed, we hope you enjoyed um, this talk. And um, we've got quite a few um, questions, or well, a couple of questions here in the, um, the chat box. So I'll just read one of them out. Um, I've been doing a gentle cardiac rehab class for 10 years since my heart attack. I'm older now and it's hard to be motivated sometimes. Is this kind of exercise also good for my legs and feet or do I need a special class? Okay. Uh, well, if you're, if you're doing some cardiac rehab, then um, first of all, you, if you're doing that with a therapist, then I'd follow the advice of the therapist. However, um, if, if it is an issue, um, you can, as I mentioned in the video, do some seated exercise, which shouldn't be too strenuous for you, with a TheraBand, which is a band that you can get. And that supplies some um, resistance to you doing some ankle movement exercises. And that, again, helps to pump um, the fluid from and the blood from your legs, from your feet into your legs and up into your body. So perhaps something seated might be more appropriate for you, especially considering your what you, you've commented here in terms of your medical history. Um, so you don't necessarily need to go to a special class. These are things that you can do at home. Um, and so, you know, you wouldn't even need to, 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 to leave your, your home. You could do these at home. There, there are online TheraBand exercises that you can um, look at as well. Um, but no, you don't necessarily need um, a special class to do TheraBand exercises, but it would be helpful for you to get some advice from um, a physio, a nurse or a podiatrist on those exercises. So there's another question here. Um, so is, is any type of trainer good or do I need to buy expensive branded ones? Yeah, so I'll answer that. So no, it's definitely not related purely to how expensive a shoe is. It's a combination of factors. So you can find very cheap high street shoes that will fit all the criteria that we recommend in a, in a good foot, in a good shoe. So the thing will be around um, ensuring that it has a nice cushioned sole, that it has something that's going to secure the shoe to your foot that is adjustable. So ideally a lace or a Velcro strap. Um, something with a little bit of rigidity around the heel 
So some shoes you will find are very flexible. You can bend the whole shoe in your hands. Something like that isn't ideal. You want a little bit of rigidity around the heel, we call, we call the heel um, cup, uh, to support the foot. Um, and then it's about the fit. So you want a shoe that's going to fit and the things that you need to look at, the basic principles of how a shoe fits should be that it's um, foot shaped. So what we mean by that is more of a rounded toe rather than a pointy shoe. Um, you can look to see whether a shoe is wide enough by slipping the insole out of the shoe, putting the insole on the ground and then placing your foot on top of the insole. And your, your foot should be on the inside of the insole. You shouldn't be spilling out over the insole. And that means that the shoe is wide enough for you. And then in terms of length, ignore the sizing because every manufacturer will make a slightly different size six or seven uh, and just put the shoe on do the shoe up and then find your longest toe and ensure there's about a centimeter about a finger's width between the end of the longest toe and the end of the shoe and that will show you that the shoe is the correct size so no you don't need to spend huge amounts of money try and follow those basic principles and you can buy a high street trainer for 25 pounds Excellent. So there's another question there. Do you want to read that out? Another question about trainers? Uh, how often would you renew your trainers if you walk in them a lot? Mm. That's a good question. So <laughs> probably about every year, possibly six months. It depends on what you classify as walk a lot. Um, you want to look for the wear in the shoe. So the sole of the shoe over time will start to wear away. Um, and the, the sides of the shoe may start to collapse as well. So if you if you're not if you put the shoe on the floor and you look at it and it looks like it's collapsing and that's the time to start replacing it. But I would have thought if you're just walking in it probably every 12 months. I think that's yeah, those those bits of advice are, are really good. Um, you know, checking definitely checking shoe wear because um, if, if you do see that the wall of the shoe, the inside wall of the shoe is starting to buckle down, yeah. then you're not going to be getting the right type of support from that shoe any longer. Um, and also laces. Laces are really important to check. So your shoes may not have worn out, but some people, they tend to use their laces um, or wear their laces out quite quite early. So always check the laces. If you need to replace the laces, those are, those are things that help to um, really hold the shoe um, onto your foot really well. So um, always check not just the shoe, but the laces as well as a tip that I would give you. I agree. And um, there's another question there, shall I ask that friend? One nurse would say walk and another would say put your legs up. That was frustrating, but I think I get it now. I need to be both, just not at once. Yes, uh, that's right. So people that have um, jobs where they're standing all day, even though they're, um, they, they are, in a sense, being active because they are upright, it's not great to be standing in the same position or even, you know, for very long periods during the day. So if you are going to be standing, walking is really, really important, but it's also important that when you can sit down and elevate your legs. So yes, definitely. Um, doing a bit of both is 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 a great um a, a great idea but yeah just be mindful of the fact that if you if you are say in a job where you're standing and walking a lot during the day that you do need to at some at some point sit down and, and put your legs up so um yes very very wise words there uh okay so there's another question here when a nurse looks at the wear of shoes when should they be worried? Hmm. Um, well, again, it's going back to what, what Debbie mentioned earlier is looking at the, the wear of the shoes. So when you, it's really good. What I find is I like to put shoes up on a table when I'm looking at shoes because, you know, you get a completely different aspect of what's happening in terms of the, the shoe wear from just looking at it on the ground. So I always like to, um, you know, put a um, paper towel down and then put the shoes up on the table and then really step back and have a good look at them from behind. And then you can really see if there's, you know, any, any adverse kind of shoe wear, especially on the insides of the shoe, where if a person has a kind of a flat foot, which is quite common, then um, you will see the wall of the shoe on the inside kind of wearing down. Also, it can give you a good idea of what's happening on the on the actual sole of the shoe. You know, you can tell a lot um, in terms of 
where that person might heel strike, for example. So if it's really worn on the outer side of the, um, the, the sole of the shoe, then they're doing a lot of you know heel striking on that side. But you can actually see in some people's shoes that, um, especially on the on on the on the uh, the sole, that um, you know they may be the heel strike might be slightly different. They might get somewhere in the middle of the back of the shoe or on the inside of the shoe. So I think it's really important that um, you know if you do see a shoe that's really buckled in, the laces are quite worn. The um, the, the, the heels on the shoes are really, really worn, then that is, is a, a time to kind of have a chat about footwear and then think about replacing those shoes. But I would say, put those shoes up on, on a place where you can actually step back and then have a good look at those shoes because looking at them on the floor when they're sitting next to the couch when you're treating a patient it is, not, is not the best way to look at the shoe wear. I think that's a really good tip, actually. I mean, what you need to think about is a shoe should be helping to support the foot. Um, so it should be secure enough that the, sh the, the sides of the shoe are, are coming up around the foot and, and cupping the foot and supporting it. So mm -hmm. if the foot is, if the shoe is completely collapsed, you can see it's not going to be able to do that job. So like Fran says, putting it up on the table so you can have a really good look is a really good tip. Mm. There's another question here. As a runner, is it worth getting your gait analysed to see what type of trainer is best for you, i.e. under or over pronation and corrective trainers? Okay, so um, that is quite, quite a few big questions there. Um, it is worth getting your, your gait analysed, um, but it depends on, on what level. A lot of shoe shops will have, will we'll advocate that they do gait analysis. However, it's just you running on a treadmill with a camera. That in a sense is not gait analysis, okay? Gait analysis is where you might also have your pressures analyzed. You might also have some, um, you know, motion, motion capture done as well. Um, so a lot of shoe shops will offer what they call gait analysis, but in my view, it's not, it's not um, full gait analysis um, they can give you some shoe shops can give you some good advice though on what type of trainer to get in terms of your foot type um, and it is really important that you do get the right trainer for your foot type um, because if you've got a very flat foot and you're in a neutral shoe then first of all that shoe is going to wear out very quickly and second of all it's not going to be offering you any the, the, the type of support that you need so it is important to get your gait looked at if you want to get the right type of shoe for, um, for running. Um, but as I mentioned in the beginning, um, to me, uh, watching someone on a treadmill isn't necessarily the, the gold standard of what I would call gait analysis. Um, someone's made a comment around, I would add to check the inside of the shoe also as that may become worn out before the outside. That's a really good point. Um, I think when it comes to the diabetic population, um, footwear is one of the primary reasons why people develop problems. And that can be not because they're not wearing an appropriate shoe, but if the lining of the shoe has rucked up, then that can be enough to cause a blister or skin irritation so absolutely so we would say to patients to check their shoes on a regular basis just put their hand inside and feel the, the sides of the shoe and make sure that lining hasn't worn away that is such an excellent point uh the the other thing i'd add about the insult and in, insides of shoes is that when you're buying shoes always check that the inside of the shoe is seamless mm -hmm. because again those seams that are inside shoes can, especially if you've got edema in the feet, if your feet swell up, then a small seam in a shoe can cause a lot of problems. So in an, in an ideal world, if you can, always when you buy shoes, check inside the shoe to make sure that there's, um, you know, as, as less seams as possible inside that shoe that could potentially cause a problem later on. But yes, definitely checking inside the shoes. That's, that's a great, a great piece of advice. Have we got any more questions? Let's see, we've got some great questions here. Um, 
So maybe a question for you, Fran. My dad will not use his Zimmer frame because he says it will make his leg muscles lazy. Is this right? Mm, okay. Um, no, I don't think this is right. Um, if your dad's been um, recommended to use a Zimmer frame, then it's more than likely it's got something to do with his balance and, you know, perhaps giving him a wider base for support for walking and standing. Um, so it's not going to make the 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 leg muscles lazy. Um, it's there for a purpose, and Zimmer frames are generally there to um, as an addition for um, providing a wider base for when you're standing and giving you some extra stability and um, helping you mobilise better and safer. Uh, and then someone's asked, how many people have foot problems and pain when walking? Um, I mean, in the populations that I treat, so in the diabetic population, that many of them don't have pain, not the issue because of their diabetes. Um, so I would say in the diabetic population, probably less of them have pain. Um, in patients with lymphedema? Well, um, yes, it's quite common um, for the patients that I see to, to report pain in the legs and feet. Um, in terms of um, how many people, well, it's quite common for people to visit the GP with foot and ankle pain. It's one of the, I think it's the second highest reason why people um, consult to GPs. So it's very, very common in the general population. Um, but yes, it, it, I do see patients that have foot, ankle problems, especially when walking, but there are things that can be done. And that's you know a great thing that they come see a podiatrist or a nurse. So there are many things that can be done to help conservative things in terms of helping to improve pain when walking. So footwears, you know, can give great advice on footwear, the right type of um, garments, the right type of socks that you should be using, orthotics that go into shoes that can be really helpful for people um, to help improve their mobility and walking, making sure that their, um, you know, muscles are balanced. So looking at strengthening and stretching. So these are all things that we can help to um, give advice on and improve um, pain and also to help with walking. Okay. So I think if there's no more questions, I've got a quick question for Fran. Mm -hmm. So Fran, you've taken on really quite a unique role at Accelerate working in the lymphedema service as a podiatrist. Um, what what do you say you've learnt since you've taken up your new role? Okay, it's been quite a learning curve, um, you know, working, going from working with patients that have, um, you know, foot and ankle pain to patients that, you know, have lymphedema and lipedema and leg ulcers. And it's just really um, having an understanding on how important and how, you know, how important compression is and um, the, the impact that it can have in a very quick way um, on a patient's life and their mobility. You know, see a lot of patients that come in, very swollen legs, they have some compression bandaging for perhaps for a couple of weeks, then go into compression garments and, you know, they can move, they can walk without, you know, pain-free, they can start to get back to their kind of, you know, th their lives again. So I think just the, the biggest thing really is, is the work that the nurses do with the compression and um, really instilling that into patients kind of, um, in, into patients' lives in terms of um, them wearing it on a, on a regular basis and how important it is. Um, and, you know, it's, it's one of those things that I never realised how, how much of a important treatment it was. So, yeah, just the, the, the work that the nurses do with the compression and the patients as well wearing that compression is, is, has been amazing to learn. And, and with, you, with you, Debbie, you know, with us, obviously, we've been working together as podiatrists. Do you feel that, you know, since I've taken on my new role and we've been, you know, talking about different things, do you feel that that's, um, you know, my new knowledge is going to be helping you and, and people working in the foot health department or other podiatrists with um, understanding lymphedema and, and these types of conditions, leg ulcers and um, lipedema? Absolutely. I mean, as a podiatrist, classically, 
you are trained in issues below the ankle and um, but you obviously see lots of legs because they are attached to the feet um but we're maybe not always as good at identifying or knowing how to manage and treat conditions that affect the leg as well as the foot and um, so you having this additional expertise has been great you know for the team that I work with at the Homerton we've been able to tap into that we've done a lot more work around what we can do as podiatrists making sure that we identify patients that have these these complaints and and what we can do to assist them so yeah absolutely mm, yeah I'm, I'm it's 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 been great talking to you and and also you know having having that that contact with with the others at, at your foot health department and um yeah being being able to help and assist with any kind of questions so um yeah excellent okay. well thank you so much debbie for um, coming this evening. And I hope everyone here has enjoyed the discussion and um, it's been great answering the questions and thank you all so much for, for coming. <laughs>